So, hey folks, I'm Mike Bouchong at Nokia. Um, when I think about where AI is going and what's the design principles, I got to start with the constraints. Like I will tell you right now, um, we treat within our industry AI as if it's a market. It's not. It's multiple markets. You've got the hyperscales, right? You know, Amazon, Google, you know, Microsoft, Meta, whoever. Um, and then you've got, you know, everyone else. And then even within that, by the way, that's not really one market because how they behave in North America or in the U.S. is going to be different than how they behave in, let's say, Brazil or what you might see in Middle East or what you might see in India because they've got different geographical constraints. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. So obviously, uh, Google and CenturyLink you know, came out and they said, we're going to build you know, a big mega data center. And so if you're going to do that, then they're going to take care of you know, sort of the power requirements. And so you might run, you know, 100 kilowatt, 120 kilowatt to, um, to the rack. And that gives you a certain architecture that you're going to go use. It means everything can be close. That's going to have impacts on things like cabling, right? So maybe you can go all copper for certain, you know, uh, scalable units that you, you build out. Or maybe, you, you know, you kind of distribute because you've got massive scale inside there, but they're going to be working within a, a pretty loose set of constraints in that environment. Now, what if you want to go and build out in Mumbai or Delhi, where you've got these massive metro populations, but it turns out you can't necessarily get access to that much land. So you don't have the same real estate. And on top of that, if you want to go and deal with you know, any of the power um, requirements, you want to talk to the, the, the regulatory companies there or, or you know, government agencies, you can't get access to all of the power that you need. And so do you still build out your gigawatt data center? Or do you maybe leverage a 20 megawatt facility because it's already built? Well, if it's a 20 megawatt facility, you know, can you get the same amount of power per rack? Or are you dealing with you know, half rack or quarter rack type stuff? And if that's the case, then if it's more distributed, what are the implications on things like you know, optics and cabling? And what does that do to you know, power distribution? And are there implications in networking? Um, how big is your cluster size? And are you going to be dealing with one cluster? Or do you now have to think about how I start extending over a wider area? Will we see you know, architectural consideration for like the WAN, as an example, and start looking at multi-site and extending clusters? Um, or do I need to manage my workloads so that I stay with, with smaller workloads? Like These are all things you have to think about. I don't think there's going to be like one size fits all for the market. I think what you see is a dynamic where everyone's chasing the hyperscalers and really kind of the top 12 companies in the world. Um, and I think what we're going to see is, is kind of a bifurcation of that. Now that bifurcation is going to be not just based on like the physical size of the data center and the geographical distribution. There's also different business models. So what everyone's trying to do now is they look at, you know, monetizing data center and look monetizing AI. You're seeing a bunch of folks come out with with um, colo and GPU as a service ambitions. So what does that look like? And are there implications on the network side? So if I wanna do a, a, an anchor tenant, I wanna build a colo for a single tenant, okay, that's relatively straightforward. If I go and let's say that, you know, hyperscale A picks up 100% of my capacity, fine, then I just build that out. And that'd be something you might see out of like the large, you know, colo folks, like a, like a digital realty maybe goes and builds a site exactly for you know, Microsoft as an example. Um, but what if I go to a, a different geography and maybe um, you don't have quite the demand there, the business case isn't quite uh, as solid. And so my anchor tenant isn't gonna pick up 100%. Maybe they're gonna pick up 60 or 80% of my available capacity. What do I do with the other 20%? So now I've got multi-tenant requirements. And so I've got to figure out, well, how do I do that? Um, is that two separate clusters and they're not, they're not I don't use the infrastructure? Well, maybe, but what if I told you that that, that 60 or 80% that my anchor tenant's going to use, what if they don't consume it all in year one? What if they pick up five megawatts a year? And so by year six, they use it all. But during in between, I've got this sort of hybrid environment. How do I do that? Do I deploy something and then use migrations? And so I may want one entire infrastructure. So now I've got to think through, like, what does that migration look like? And, and how am I rolling that stuff out? If I do that, then I've got to think through architecturally, not just how do I connect it? How much power do I need? You know, what am I doing from a GPU perspective? I've got to also think about how is that going to be consumed? Is it going to be consumed as a service? If it's as a service, then is there a self-service portal? If that's the case, how do I do things like 
um, you know, workload tuning. So what do my operations look like? What's my service catalog look like? How do I handle things like billing? There's a lot more that goes into this than just, you know, how many devices do I have? Um, you know, how many racks am I going to use? How much power do I need? You got to think through like all of the software bits. Then all of that gets into, you know, a bunch of other implications around, you know, how do I monitor? How do I troubleshoot? Like these are all, I would consider these architectural considerations though more on the operation side. When we're focused on hyperscale, we don't really focus on the operations piece because inherently what the hyperscalers do is they solve the operations bits themselves. That's um, part and parcel with what, what they bring to the table. But for everybody else, and even in the case where the hyperscalers are jointly using you know, some of these facilities with folks, then those operational burdens get passed on and they become a necessary add-on architectural. You got to think about it as, as part of the overall decision. Um, because then it also gets into things like how do you procure, by the way, right? If you're going to go all in with, you know, a particular generation of, of uh, you know, GPU, that's one thing. But if you've got sort of a, a split environment where you've got different pricing sensitivities, different workload sizes, maybe you actually change it up a bit. All of those things need to play a role. And then they get into, you know, kind of the implications when it comes to actually laying out your, your racks and whatnot. So what do we build in order to meet some of these divergent architectural needs? Uh, look, bottom line is there's gonna be industry-wide decisions about InfiniBand versus Ethernet. Uh, we believe Ethernet wins out. I don't think it's gonna be an absolute you know, winner take all. I think you're gonna see a, a, a split in the market and you know, there's gonna be a, a bit of a, a vendor dynamic as NVIDIA and Broadcom kind of square off. Um, what we'll do from the Ethernet side, you know, Broadcom's a strong partner for us. You know, we believe that we'll bring out you know, Tomahawk class um, devices. Uh, certainly that means, you know, Tomahawk 4, Tomahawk 5, Tomahawk 6, as you look at, you know, the, the move from uh, different generations and CX7 to CX8 will drive, you know, some of the 800 gig work. Um, we think that Merchant Silicon, you know, provides superior economics there and that we think, at, especially at scale, you know, the per unit economics are going to dominate. Obviously, Ethernet and InfiniBand are going to go head to head on a, a features and performance kind of thing. And so, you know, things like lossless and congestion handling, you know, start to matter. Um, there's different ways architecturally to handle this uh, just from a software architecture perspective or like a, a network architecture, but a software features perspective. Um, and so there, you know, we'll rely on the UEC. Uh, we think that standards win. If you care about economics, then you care about choice and flexibility. You only get choice and flexibility when there's interchangeability, meaning everyone's got to be able to play the same role. So we think the UEC is you know, obviously the de facto standard body that's going to bring out recommendations. So we'll follow the UEC. There's going to be some interesting decisions that are made there, right? Do we put intelligence in the fabric? Do we push intelligence out to the NICs? I think those decisions will get you know, played out in, in those architectural committees with um, input and buy-in from all the different players. Um, and then, you know, obviously AI is more than just networking. <laughs> you got to have uh, compute and storage, right? So, you know, we will aggressively, you know, partner with folks, you know, earlier this year, we've uh, announced partnerships with Lenovo and with Kindrel, um, you know, Lenovo in particular is really around bringing a full stack AI solution. Um, obviously there's going to be GPUs that come from AMD as well. And so we think that, you know, we'll, we'll partner with, with those folks so we can bring out kind of robust solutions. Um, and then all of these things will be managed. And so we've got, you know, management um, products as well. So for the hyperscalers, they're unlikely to use products provided by a vendor. They do care about things like uh, streaming telemetry, uh, GNMI, uh, gRPC. We've got the world's best implementation of northbound interfaces, uh, which gives really unprecedented insight into what's happening at a, a device and even like kind of individual software level. Um, and then from there, um, we build an operations platform that's multi-vendor. So if you believe that economics are going to rule the day, then you got to believe multi-vendor matters. Um, things like lead times are going to matter, especially with next-gen uh, platforms, you know, where you've got limited supply to, to early runs of some of these chips. Uh, so we believe multi-vendor operations is going to rule the day. And we've built out a platform we call uh, Nokia EDA. Uh, which is really around you know, multi-vendor intent-based management, which effectively relegates um, the operations challenge to uh, working with a set of declarative models. Tell me what your data center looks like, not necessarily what the config is, and allow us to translate that into Nokia or into Sonic or into Cisco or whatever. Um, and so the idea there is that we can give people choice and flexibility. 
which leads to my, my closing point. You know, here we have a flagship operating system, uh, SR Linux, but we've actually announced support for Sonic as well. We've got you know, announcements in the public space where Microsoft has come out and you know, renewed their five-year commitment with us. Um, we want to give customers choice. And so you know, whether you're using SR Linux or you're using Sonic, we want to meet you where you are and try to you know, really enable the, the decisions that you want to make on your terms. And so we've got kind of the full complement of hardware, software, and management to make that possible. You bring that together in kind of an AI form factor, and then we partner with you know, whether, you know, Lenovo, Kindrel, whoever, in order to bring things out. That gives us kind of the, the means to not just provide the technology, but to help people with the deployment and you know, ultimately the successful rollout of their you know, AI service or, or AI you know, capabilities. It gives us a, a fairly complete set of offerings. And my Steve Jobs one more thing moment is that's before you consider the Infinera acquisition, which gives us access to the pluggables, which if you think about like the total size of the bill of materials, like 50% of the bomb is gonna be pluggables. When we have both the equipment and the optics on that, that puts us in a really unique position to do some, some incredibly compelling things for our customers. So if you're doing stuff in AI, look, you gotta have a look um, because I think the, you know, what we're doing is compelling. And frankly, it's, it's based on where the industry is going, you know, open standards, UEC and whatnot, have a look. But the other thing about you know, AI is that if we're gonna um, build out data centers that are not you know, islands, that these things have to be linked, there is a routing component. You know, right now we talk a lot about switching. Um, there's a piece that's like, how do you interconnect that? What happens with the DCI layer? You know, some of the stuff that we've done with you know, CoreWeave, I think, is instructive and, and really speaks to the strength that we have from a portfolio perspective. Um, all of that to say that as people consider what they're doing in the AI space, I think there's you know, a consideration you know, from a networking perspective on what happens on the switching layer. I think there's additional consideration, you know, what happens from like an optics and cabling perspective. I think you also got to consider what's going to happen from a DCI and, and sort of a backend connectivity, because at the end of the day, these data centers are going to connect to other things and you're going to want, you know, high bandwidth, high speed, very reliable transport. And, and that's, that's just as big a part as what's happening inside the racks. Mm -hmm.